Hello and welcome to Cutline in the Community. I'm Eric Marcus, host of today's program when we'll be exploring the impact of family separation as seen through the lens of the Holocaust. First, we'll be screening a new short documentary that I co-produced for the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies called The Last Time I Saw Them. That'll be followed by a conversation with our special guests about how past experiences of family separation relate to the present day. Before we get to the film, I'd like to introduce our guests. First, Marcy Shore is an author, translator, and associate professor of history at Yale University. She's a member of the Fortunoff Video Archives Faculty Advisors Council. Timothy Snyder is also a Fortunoff Archive Faculty Advisor, and he's a best-selling author, public intellectual, and the Richard C. Levin Professor of History at Yale. His scholarship has been recently focused on the rise of illiberal forces on both sides of the Atlantic. Efren Oliveras is a lawyer, advocate, and the deputy legal director for the Southern Poverty Law Center's Immigrant Justice Project. He's been working with immigration advocacy organizations on the southern border of the United States for the past several years. Welcome. Marcy, um, since you commissioned the 22-minute documentary we're about to watch, uh, can you tell me briefly, before we watch the film, what inspired you to ask the archive to produce it? Yes, I'm happy to tell that story. It came about in spring of 2018 when I first read the news one morning about the children and their parents on the American border. And I know very little about matters of immigration into America. You know, I'm a historian of Eastern Europe. I work on a different time, a different place. I know very little about Latin America, about Central European and Central American refugees. Um, but my, my visceral reaction was that something horrific was happening, you know, something that resonated with me as a historian of Eastern Europe and that as scholars, as historians, as Americans, as human beings, we needed to intervene in some way. And I, it was a spontaneous idea I emailed uh, Stephen Naron at the Fortune of Archive because I, I know that archive and I've worked on the Holocaust myself and I know that there's extraordinary material there. You know, and of course, this is something that happened very often during the Holocaust that children were taken away from their parents and thrown in camps. And I said, Stephen, we have to do something. This has to be some moment where we can use this material to make an intervention. I didn't know how. I don't know anything about making a film. I'm not a very visually oriented person. Um, it was a very spontaneous idea, but Stephen didn't say, you're crazy. Stephen listened to me and said, okay, let's think about how we can do this. Oh, great. And that's and what happened then was that, that Stephen called me um, and said, um, can we do this? Um, and I said, um, Sure, uh, we can do this, not knowing exactly what we we're going to do. Um, and then I uh, decided to call one of my friends who I'd worked with on a previous documentary, and we figured, figured out how to do it. So great, thank you for, for explaining. Um, we'll have plenty of time to talk about uh, more about this after the film. So now here's the last time I saw them. I come from a family of six children. And I was the oldest. Yeah, in between us, there was a brother, Chaim. And after me, my mother had twins, but uh, one of them died. Her name was Frida. Then it is Judith. And her little brother, Jan Kala. We lived a very happy life. My father was a businessman, and we were educated in Czechit and in Yiddish, we had a yeshiva in the town that we supported. We never experienced any anti-Semitism under the Czech government. 
we associated, my friends were Czech, you know. So we had a very happy home life. The Hungarian um, army came in and, and they then they occupied, occupied the Carpath. They took our business away. They just plain blind came in and, and they and occupied it. And they told you get out and that was it. It was like rumbling, uh, rows of tanks were coming through the town and they parked those tanks in the center. We heard those noises during the night. And in the morning, there was a knock on our door and there were two SS standing. And he said, let's go. Right. Towards the end, they started to liquidate the ghetto. They started to ship people out. We went like they ship animals, you know, those open trains. They never opened up the cars. It never stopped. It just constantly was going. And we were suffocated practically there. And because there were so many people crammed into a small place, there was no water, people were fainting, elderly people were dying. And finally, after three days of traveling, the train suddenly stopped and suddenly opened up the doors. And I heard they say that, man, here, this goes here. The people started yeah, panicking. Started they didn't know when they was going with those rubber sticks, you know, here, there. And we were very scared and we didn't know nothing. I remember my father was grabbed my brother, you know, and my mother, the, 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 five, the five kids, my mother and me, my sister, we were holding together. And as we come down, there were the SS pushing my father here. They the announced room, that. And we go here. And my mother was going with me and my sister. And there was 8, 10, 11. They pushed it here. And I remember my, my mother, the kids start crying, Mommy, Mommy, you know. And my mother pulled herself away from me. And she says, You should take care of your sister like a mirror. The minute we stepped off the freight train, we were separated right there and then. My father and my older brother went on one side. My sister, she was a tall girl, so they made her go to one side. And I went with my mother and with the uh, younger children. And my mother looked around and she says, well, where's uh, your sister? I said, they made her go over there. So she tells me, you run after her because she only has one dress on her. And they pushed her on one side, and I was running from one place to another, and I don't know how, because in Auschwitz, you just did not run from one place to another. But somehow I caught up with her, and uh, I found her, and we were uh, marching. You know, they took us into a section where all the women arrivals came in. And that was a big, long barracks, and you stay there. We were in Auschwitz for three days in barracks. And outside, all that going down, there was a big band music, playing yeah. music constantly, day and night. There was smoke, heavy smoke. There were babies screaming. You were looking where it's come from, but you couldn't see where it's come from. Everybody was screaming and crying and running. And, and they said, you know, don't cry. You'll be after they go shower and they'll, you'll meet them in the afternoon. They'll meet again. And since then, that was the I last have time we never saw. Seen my, my, mother, father, my father, my brother, my grandmother, my mother, and the, and and the four younger brother. That was the last time I've seen them. I had never heard uh, anything about my uh, rest of the family until one day I was sitting by the window, I was mending the socks, and this friend of mine walks into the room and he said to me, yeah, Sylvia, what are you going to give me? I have a surprise for you. And I picked up my hat and I saw my sister standing in the yard, you know, in the courtyard. So first I thought I was seeing things. And then she gave a yell and I ran out in the courtyard and we both fainted right there in the spot. I attended a uh, Jewish school at Das Yisrael in Berlin, as did my sister. Most of the time, we were very aware of the fact that we live in dangerous times. On Kornidl, uh, before we went to synagogue, it's the custom for father to bless his children. 
And I remember all the years that I can think back that when my father blessed my sister and me, he always cried. And I assume that it was because they knew. Small as you were, you, you realized that. And of course, we were confronted daily, daily, with the swastika and the hordes. And in the glass cases on the street corners, the display of the Stürmer. My father would sometimes pick one up in a train and bring it home. So there was this feeling of an impending doom. He was taken away very early in the morning. My mother was crying and there was such to do that my sister and I woke up and we ran to see what was going on. And uh, I remember the policeman saying, as far as he knows, that they're being deported to Poland. And um, that's the last time I saw my father. When Kastanacht came, it was a, a disaster. And it became clear that life for Jews in Germany was all over. Decisions had to be made as to who should go and who should not go. For example, uh, one of my uncles and aunts decided not to send both of their children. They would send one child to test the waters and keep one child with them uh, to see if this would work because there was no certainty. It was actually fraught with danger. And we were made aware of the fact that we would be carrying a luggage tag in our lapel and all it would say is the name and the district and building in which we live. No street, nothing else, no identity. And that we were to act as though we didn't know from where we came. We left in the morning, early in the morning. It was time so that we would get to the border at night because we needed the cover of darkness, of course. I remember leaving from Bahnhof Zoo, and I remember that not about a minute or two out of Bahnhof Zoo, on the elevated tracks of the railroad, came into view the hull of this burned and destroyed famous synagogue of Berlin, Fasanstrasse. And that was the last stab in the heart for a little Jewish boy to see the burnt hulk of this famous synagogue. I also remember very well that my mother took me into a corner in this railroad compartment. I remember well what she said to me in order to make sure I understood, because of course I was a little boy, very attached to my mother. It was a great love relationship. In that little speech in the train, I always say I became bar mitzvah. I have not been formally bar mitzvah. When I was 13, I was not bar mitzvah. I was bar mitzvah when I was 11 by my mother. No minion, no rabbi. I was given my, my orders, my commandments as to what to do. And I remember that. I was to be the, the hero of the family and tougher to Zion, to be courageous. And so the journey took, took its last hour or two. At the station, as we got off the train, uh, my mother said to me, you must not try, you must, turn, must not turn around and look back and you must not cry. And she did not kiss me good enough, goodbye because there was just no time. We, took, we went to the left, we children, and I remember my mother and the other lady turned to the right. And that was the last we saw of them. And that was December the 6th, 1938, in the middle of the night. I remember having to go to a photographer in Hochefein to have pictures taken. I still have those pictures in the little Dutch folder at home. And uh, we got to England. And that was, of course, the last I saw of my sister, who unfortunately perished in Bergen-Belsen.
I was living uh, with my family, my father, mother, and a brother who was five years younger. I went to school. We were living a life of wonderful affluence and happiness. We went skiing in the winter, swimming in the summer. This is uh, uh, my brother and myself. My Jewishness was more, mostly combined with, with sports. And uh, we, we went Friday night sometimes into the synagogue, but it was more of a Onik Shabbat kind of thing. We, I know we drove with the car to the synagogue. You lost your childhood, I think, at that moment. Mm -hmm. You suddenly were wearing a star and you were not allowed to be in a tram sitting with other people. You had to be standing on, on one of the outside places. Uh, very similar to discrimination in this country where the blacks were pushed to the side. In Theresienstadt, at one point, they were testing some um, vaccine against scarlet fever. So people were sick. Then they were trying to, to get some vaccine for jaundice. I was laying in bed with my brother that had an enormous jaundice. And my mother had very dangerous uh, scarlet fever. She was burning up with enormous fever. It was freezing. It was muddy. They didn't let people go to the bathroom and people had to uh, relieve themselves while they were standing with tears in their eyes. I remember one incident, my brother telling my mother that he was hungry and she had nothing to give him and she was crying. And that was certainly mm -hmm. enough for me never to mention anything, anything at all. My mother said, now, I was at that point almost 14. She said, you are going to tell them you are 18 and you volunteer and you go and you, you go with uh, the rest of the women. I will stay with my brother. And my, her explanation was that she has to stay with my brother because he would forget his name. And I must admit that I was very angry at my mother for a very, very long time, mm. that she didn't save herself for me. I passed through the selection. I was now selected to go to Germany to work. And I suddenly see that there was somebody, they were examining women. And somebody got up from the table and she was bleeding. And I lost it. I started to cry. I went back to my mommy. Yeah. and they couldn't quiet me down. And a, and a German lady, a guard, came over to me and asked me, why are you crying? And I spoke very nicely German, and I said to her, I want to go back to my mommy. She took me to her room, and she gave me cocoa, which I didn't see for years and years and years. And she says to me, now, I will tell you something, and please listen to me. Don't cry and don't try to get back to your parents. You are better off. You are here with women that know you. They speak the same language. And you're going out into Germany. You're, gonna, you're getting out of here. She really saved my life. And then I found out um, later that my mother with my little brother, they went to the gas chambers the next day, the moment we left, the, the men left, then the women left for hard labor to go mm -hmm. to Germany. They took the older and the women with the children and they gassed them.
My father's name was Erwin Bloch. My mother was Marta and I had a brother, George. Both my grandparents were farmers, which was quite unusual for a Jewish family. Both of my grandparents had farms and my parents grew up there. I remember my grandmother very well. She was gorgeous, white hair, very lovely. And she was um, killed when she was uh, 86 years old by the Germans. There was um, very little food. The work was very dreadfully hard, and uh, there, it was completely closed. It was so claustrophobic, and there was absolutely uh, not enough food. For me, uh, lunch was especially horrible because of the children. They cried and cried, and then. He stopped crying one day. They executed, I don't know how many people, because I never had the courage to go and look. They let them hang on the square for several days. My mother went there because she said someone has to pray for them. From time to time, the Germans came and they took people away. The Germans went from uh, one place to the other and then they let us go in the street and uh, there was this always this officer, a German officer, uh, who said this person goes this way and this person goes back. And they took all the old people and the children and took them away. We went out of the train, and they, right there they started dividing women from men, and I only could see my father's face, and he said, take care of mother, and that was all. I, never, you know, I didn't see him walking away. It was just such a crowd, you see. And um, we walked hand in hand with my mother, and there was uh, Mengele, and he showed my mother to the right side, and to, and I wanted to go with her. And there was a soldier, and he threw me to, to the ground and said, you stay here. And I said, where are these people going? What's going to happen to them? And he said, don't be hysterical. In a few hours, you are going to see them again. Very vividly, I can, I can see pictures, like in a movie. You know, I can see details, but I have, there is no connection. And the last... Um, uh, night, um, I, uh, I don't think I spoke to anybody the whole time I was in Auschwitz. I just lost all uh, capability of communi communicating with people. And I sort of crawled aside and I uh, thought my mother, I, my, I couldn't think about anything except my mother, my mama. And I remember sitting on the ground and I hold up my hand and there was this big, um, you know, the dandelions? And it came to me and it landed on my hand and I thought, my mother, she's here. I think maybe she just died that moment.
Welcome back. If you're just joining us, I'm Eric Marcus, host of today's program and co-producer of the documentary, The Last Time I Saw Them. We're joined by our special three guests, Marcy Shore, Timothy Snyder, and Efren Oliveris. Marcy and Timothy are both professors of history at Yale, and Efren is the deputy legal director for the Southern Poverty Law Center's Immigrant Justice Project. So Marcy, as you explained before we watched The Last Time I Saw Them, you were inspired to commission the film by what happened with families being separated on the U.S. southern border. I have a question for you about whether that's a fair comparison, but I wanted to ask Efren first to explain what exactly happened on the U.S. southern border for those viewers who might not be familiar with what the Trump administration did. So Efren, what happened? In late May 2018, I was based in McAllen, Texas, and one afternoon I received a phone call from a federal public defender. She was an attorney representing individuals who had crossed the border and were being prosecuted criminally for crossing the border. And she called me to tell me that an increasing number of her clients were telling her that they had been traveling with their children, five-year-old, seven-year-old. And when they came to court, they hadn't seen their children in a few days and they didn't know where their children were or when they might see them again. And this was before the, the issue of family separations at the southern border received any sort of media attention. So my reaction was to ask her if we could talk to these families, get their information, document, you know, names, names of children, and any information we could gather to try to then search for the children. So the very next morning, um, one of our paralegals, Georgina and I, w went to the courthouse to interview the parents who were, had been separated that morning. And that day, in a group of over 90 immigrants who were being processed, there were five parents who had been separated from their children from Guatemala and El Salvador. And we started interviewing them. You know, we only had a few minutes with each of them to take their name, their date of birth, their, you know, ages of the children and where they might be headed. That was, at the time, the only information that was being kept of the children who were separated. Um, we started doing that in late May and then ended up doing that for the, the month of June until an executive order uh, stopped the large majority of the separations. But in that process, we interviewed almost 400 parents who had been separated from their children. And what we discovered right away is that in the vast majority of the cases, the parents were led to believe that they were coming to court for their hearing and that when they came back to the Border Patrol station, their children would be there. And as the days went by, we found out that that was not the case, that the children had been sent away to shelters, in some cases across the country. Some of these parents were separated from their children for, for months. Some of them still are separated from them. And um, uh, we also learned that the government was not keeping track of which children had been traveling with which parent, which was extremely problematic in all cases, but particularly for the very young children. So did you have any sense um, when you got that first call that, that this was government policy? And I wonder what, what you, because hearing you tell this is so shocking that, uh, because you didn't know, know what the government policy was, um, I wonder what you thought. You know, at the time, the only policy we had heard about was the zero tolerance policy, which called for a criminal prosecution of everyone who crossed the border. But when I got that phone call, I remember thinking, there's no way. It can't be that way. Not in 2018 in the United States of America. It's not possible that the government will be taking children systematically from their parents and not telling them where they are going, who's taking care of them, when they might see them again. I just could not fathom that. But sure enough, the next morning and the following weeks, that was exactly what was going on. It's, I, I find it breathtaking and it just, I find it so upsetting even hearing you tell it now. I mean, I've certainly read all about it and followed the story very closely in no small part because I grew up with, with kids whose parents were on the kinder transports and were sent from Germany uh, to safety, never to see their parents again. And I couldn't believe that our government was doing such a thing. I mean, we weren't killing the parents, but we were separating them. So Marcy, I know you made the leap from, from this story to what you knew of the Holocaust and family separation, but really is it, can we make that 
comparison. Is it fair or was the Holocaust a singular event? Let me say a couple things in response to that. I mean, sure. first, I would say that even though I don't have any experience of the southern border, it was not difficult for me to imagine myself in that situation. When I was training to be a historian in the 1990s, running around Eastern Europe, there were many more survivors of Nazism and Stalinism as well who, rem who were still alive in the 1990s. I met a lot of them, and those encounters were very important to my coming of age as a historian and understanding what the horrors of the 20th century were about. Everyone who survived, who got through Nazism or Stalinism or both, at some point had to flee in desperate, dire circumstances and survived to meet me in the 1990s only because they got lucky and somebody was kind to them somewhere at some point. Um, and because what we do as historians is we try to read ourselves into other people's stories, it was not difficult for me to imagine those parents on the border. Um, in, in the interim between the 1990s and now, I have become a parent. You know, I have two young kids. And it was not hard for me to imagine that if I were fleeing with my children and somebody tried to take my children away, I would be capable of killing someone. That is not a human situation. And so the first impulse was not intellectual, it was visceral. Um, now, as a historian, one of the things that we're always working in is what is particular and what is universal. Or I should say, as a historian of intellectual history, I work a lot with history of philosophy. The relationship between what is universal and what is particular is central in philosophy. Historians often work with a kind of middle layer, you know, with a category that is in between the universal and the particular, be it nation, class, religion, race, ethnicity. But that which is irreducibly unique, you know, and that which is common, you know, and transcends borders is a, an epistemological question we constantly ask ourselves, you know. And so it was natural for me to ask that question. No situation is ever exactly the same as any other situation. No historical moment is ever exactly the same, just like no human being is exactly the same as any other human being. But that doesn't mean we don't learn things, you know, about people from knowing people or we don't learn things about different moments in different situations from understanding other moments in other situations. So for me, this was not a kind of Kierkegaardian yes, no, either or question. For me, this was a question about how. How do we use the past to help us better understand the present? Uh, and that's and that's what you've done with with creating this this document with by commissioning this documentary, is bringing the past to the present. Now, Tim, um, when are, are historical comparisons relevant, and why do we need them? Um, and, and do we need them? I guess I would say that we when we say history, we shouldn't immediately say comparison, because when we say comparison, it's like we're saying now versus then, or us versus those people. It's like we're treating history as a, a series of discrete moments. And the implication there is always that something must have fundamentally changed. There must have been progress. We must be better. We, we must be different. I would say that before we even think about whether it's a comparison, we look at the common threads and we look at the continuities. We look at history as more like a flow. You know, this in this in this film that we just watched, we have we have these five people who were still alive in the 21st century or the late 20th century talking about things that happened to them in the 1930s and 1940s. That's a flow. That's a flow from Europe into American life. Those are experiences about about being a refugee, about being deported, about being separated from your family, which are which are human experiences. Those human experiences were brought to the United States. They're there for us to learn from if, if we want to. And the second thing, which I think is important, is that one of the things that historians of the Holocaust learned in the 1980s is that you have to listen to the voices of the people. So before you, know, you and I, or before, you know, before um, a defender of the policy says like, hey, these things are different, you have to actually listen. I mean, but in the 1980s, historians of the Holocaust were, 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 were minimizing it and they were understanding it entirely from the point of view of German documents. You know, I can imagine historians of the future looking back at the Trump child, child separation policy and just reading government documents 
and missing something which is essential about it, which is the, the inhumanity, which is the way that if you do something like this, it always involves a lie, a lie to those parents, right? A lie to those children, a lie that's then repeated and then echoes outward and echoes down the generations. You, you, you miss the way that when policemen or, or other officials behave like this, they change, they become capable of doing other things. And then and to echo something which is implicit, I think, in what both Marcy and a friend have said, there are things that are possible that you don't realize are possible. And the history of the Holocaust isn't there to tell us exactly how things are going to be the future. The history of the Holocaust is there to tell us that that range of what's possible that you didn't think was possible goes very, very deep. And it can go very, very deep, very, very quickly. That's, that's one of the things that I, that I find so striking is how quickly things can change because the Holocaust wasn't the Holocaust when it started out. And, um, and you mentioned, Timothy, the, the lies that people are told. I'm reminded of some of the, the testimonies I've listened to where people were told lies in order to put them in a position where they would, would lower their guard. Um, and then awful things were done. Or they were told, oh, don't worry, you'll be seeing them again. Just behave. And, uh, and they behaved and they never saw their loved ones again. Um, hearing these stories is so different from reading the stories. I wonder, um, Efren, what you think, having watched this film now, what is the power of hearing the voices and uh, seeing the stories told about the past? How real is it for you when you see these stories and hear them? I still get chills thinking about what these parents told me. You know, we had a few mm -hmm. minutes with them in court but speaking with them, hearing them, I had at least two mothers tell me that the guards, the Border Patrol agents told them they were taking their daughters for a bath and they never brought them back. And, you know, thinking of the, is, is this a singularity or is there universality in, in this point? I think if we start parsing out factual differences, distinctions, we are, we are missing the point. To me, the, the universality here is the othering of human beings you know we, we we express a commitment to human rights i believe that as human beings we are all deserving of some basic rights but when you other other people when you see them as differently as different than you be that and, and therefore less than you be that because of skin color race religion language nationality whatever that is it allows people to go to extreme lengths and in, in the suffering you can cause other people and a turning point in, in, in the summer of 2018, and, and it goes to your question, Eric, about hearing them, was when that audio of children crying in one of the Border Patrol cages was, was leaked. Because the power of that audio was that it wasn't video. And in hearing those children cry and say, mommy, mommy, and just cry incontrollably, is that when you hear those children, you don't see the color of their skin. And those cries of those children are universal. Yes, I find um, I, I work on a, also a podcast for the Fortune Alpha Video Archive called Those Who Were There. And uh, these are drawn from the videotaped uh, testimonies that were given by, by survivors and witnesses to the Holocaust, that hearing the voices and not actually seeing the people um, has such enormous power. And because of the way also we listen to podcasts using earbuds, we hear the voices in our heads, so it's very intimate. Um, so that in some ways the audio is more important than the visual. Um, we focus more when we're not watching. So as powerful as I think the documentary is, um, and actually I can hardly watch uh, the last time I saw them. I had to watch it over and over again when I was working on it. And when I work, I can detach myself or dissociate. But actually watching the finished film, I wept. And I actually hope not to have to watch it one more time. But it's the listening when I hear the voices and I still hear the voices in my head that has such power. And I remember that audio of the, of the children crying for their parents. And I thought, how could, we, how could we do that? How could we treat people in that way? Um, and this is a question for, for the three of you. People often say that we need to remember the Holocaust so we don't, remember the, uh, we don't repeat the past. But... You know, sometimes I think, does remembering make any difference? We humans seem to be horrible creatures when the guardrails come off. So 
does remain, remembering make any, any difference? And um, Marcy, I wonder if you can start with, uh, with responding to that question. I do think it does, and I think there are things that we can learn. Um, one of the things that, you know, and first, thank you so much for making the film. I had the idea to make the film, but I did none of the actual work making the film. That, that was you and your team and Stephen. We're listening to people in the film who are adults, and they're older adults at the time their testimonies are being filmed. And they're speaking about things that happened decades and decades earlier when they were children. And it has never been made okay for them. They are not okay. What happened to them is not okay. Um, Hedda Margolis Kovali, who appears in that film, um, I, I knew a bit personally before she died. Um, some of you may have read her extraordinary memoir, Under a Cruel Star. She was one of the great women of the 20th century, and she was one of the strongest women of the 20th century. She was one of the strongest women I have ever met anywhere in any country. And you see in that film that that losing her mother, that separation from her mother, the moment when they take her away, um, and she was 19 at the time, she was already an adult, she has never gotten over it. And now she's no longer alive, but there's no way to make that okay. And knowing that and thinking about those children, you know that they're never going to be okay again, that what's being done to them is something so unforgivable that, you know, hopefully at some point they're reunited with the parents, but they will never be all right again. You've yeah. done something to them that can never be compensated for. Yeah, actually I actually have a question about that that, that I'm going to uh, ask you shortly. Um, Timothy, what do you think? Does, does remembering make any difference or are we I just irredeemable? Absolutely. R remembering makes a difference. That's one of the basic lessons of, of totalitarianism in, in the part of the world I know something about, uh, that the, 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 people, the people who want to rule you in the worst ways are, are going to start by trying to make you forget. And, and, and we as Americans are, are forgetful people. Um, we're, we're, for, we're forgetful about the, the basic elements of our history, whether it's the Southern border, whether it's Native Americans, whether it's African American history. You have to remember in order to be honest with yourself, honest with yourself about your country, but also, also honest with yourself about what you and your fellow citizens are capable of doing because you've done it in the past. But also, um, if you remember, I mean, it's important to, when we say remember, not just to remember the things that you think you know, but to actually learn about the Holocaust, right? I mean, we do a lot of talking about remembering, but sometimes we just mean let's repeat the things that we've already heard other people say. Like, for example, how many people know that the first major act of violence in the Holocaust was a deportation of undocumented immigrants? Basically nobody. But in 1938, the, the, the first major violent action by the SS was a deportation of Jews who didn't, ha who didn't have German passports. That was shocking at the time. And nobody remembers that. If you know the history of the Holocaust, then you see more connections. And then, and then the, the the final thing is, if if you if you have a sense of the past, then you're not surprised, right? I mean, in, in a way, like your conversation with Efren and Marcy is about how they reacted, right? And you can react to an event only if it calls forth some set of associations for you. And so even those associations aren't a perfect echo, they give you a place to start. They give you a place to dig in and say, okay, I have an idea where this might be going, so I'm going to do something now and not just, and not just wait. Yeah, Fran, you were witness to so much of this, this horror on the U.S. southern border and heard so many stories. And Marcy raised this issue about making things right that you never can. Um, I actually have a twofold question for you. First, there are still hundreds of children who have yet to be reunited, reunited with their parents. First, what obligation do we have to them? And then secondly, is there any way to make things right with the more, th more than 5,000 families that were forcibly separated? We can never make it completely right, but is there anything we can do to begin to try to uh, make it up to these families? You know, there are hundreds of children who are still separated from their parents as a result of this policy. And it's possible that some of them may never be reunited. And even those who are, the damage may be lifelong. Um, 
to your point also about the importance of remembering, I think countries and societies that have gone through traumatic human rights violations, like I consider the family separation policy, have opted for truth and reconciliation commissions so that there's a discussion about what happened, how did it happen, so that it, it is a, a healing process and it memorializes for future generations that this happened in 2018 and that, you know, let's be honest about how, what our government did in our name, how this was possible, who was responsible for it, so that the very first step, as Timothy was saying, is to be honest with ourselves about the facts. And in, in this day and age, it's very difficult. I have heard interviews of Border Patrol agents who claim that they're not sure if there were any family separations, that they would need to look at the data to confirm that, which is outrageous to me. But that is the risk that we run if we are not careful in first and foremost documenting that this in fact happened and collecting testimonies of these families. And something like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission could be a, 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 an avenue to do that. And then on the practical side of things, I think for, for those families who are in the United States, ensuring that they receive asylum or immigration relief so that they are not in fear of deportation ever again. And, and those who were deported uh, without their children that are allowed to come back into the United States and present their cases, at the end of the day, our government tortured them. That is the least we could do for them. Marcy, I wonder if you have thoughts about that as well. I think Efren's in a much better position to answer that question. I mean, I certainly think everything should be done to immediately reunite those children with their parents. I think everything should be done to compensate them and try to mitigate the trauma that they've been through. I certainly think they should be allowed to, to remain in the United States. Let me maybe add on that topic that one of the things that, I mean, one of the things that remembering can help us with is the fact that it's so difficult to grasp what's going on and the implications in real time. I mean, this is Efron's field, and he's saying when he first heard that this was happening, he couldn't believe it. Even though we're a good ways into the Trump administration, we understand what the attitude is towards the border. We understand the kind of grotesque lack of concern for other people's lives and for human rights, you know. But still, there's a moment of not being able to believe. And one of the things we learned from the past is that by the time we've understood what's going on, we've often normalized what's what's com completely unimaginable. I mean, one of the lessons of the Holocaust is not just the technicalities of how you kill people or let's look at the fences in this camp and compare it to the fences in that camp. You know, the bigger lessons are things that the borders slip really, really quickly in the sense of the boundaries of the possible. They slip really quickly. The thing that was completely inconceivable and unimaginable can become the new normal a few months later. And by the time people are aware that that's happened, we've already somehow adjusted to it. Yeah, I have a final question for the three of you. Um, there are crises around the world with refugees seeking safe harbor. And I can tell you when I see these stories, I think of my family fleeing Europe in the early 20th century and finding safe harbor here. Um, and sneaking in through Canada or through Argentina because they weren't welcome here. Um, and not a lot of countries have put out the welcome mat for refugees in this day and age, and quite the opposite. And I have to admit that I feel pretty hopeless um, about us humans, that we seem to repeat this sort of thing again and again and, and make the refugees the other. And I wonder if you can briefly each tell me, what do you, what do you think, um, Timothy? Well, I, I think the kinds of things we're, we've been talking about in this conversation actually help with this. I mean, the, this the, this film that's that's been produced re reminds us that you know re refugees are are our sons and and daughters, and, and 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 refugees are people who've experienced something perhaps that we haven't experienced ourselves. Um, and another important underlying theme in this conversation has been that of human rights. That that's an idea which. Um, the United States, unfortunately, has ignored under the Trump administration, but it wasn't there at the time of the Second World War. Now we have it. I mean, now we have the argument that people have a claim which goes beyond what what any state is 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 going to is going to do to them or do or do for them, and that's the kind of progress. And I mean, as as for hope, I, I think I think hope comes hope comes with with labor. I mean, as as historians, Marcy and I are concerned about 
about the same thing a friend is concerned about. We're concerned about documenting this because one of the ways things go wrong is that big things happen in the history of your country and they're not remembered as big things in the history of your country. So you have to grasp onto the moment. You have to see something like this as an axial point in your country's history, speak gently and appropriately to the people who have survived it, make it a topic. And, you know, I think then there's, it's not certain things will get better, but these are the kinds of things we can, we can do that we know are the right thing in the moment and, and may make things better in the future. Thank you, Timothy. Marcy, what do you think? Well, I would say, First, that hope is an act of faith, you know, and because I have children and I brought them into this world, I have to have hope that we can make this world somehow better. The question of refugees and statelessness for me as a historian, you know, has been central to the experience of certainly of modernity. There's a very famous passage in Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism, where she talks about the refugees at the end of the First World War, when you first needed a passport to cross borders in Europe. And she said, what we learned from that is that suddenly, if you don't have a passport, if you're stateless, there is no such thing as human rights. What we learned from that was how thin our understanding of human rights was, because it turns out that in the absence of a state to guarantee them, they mean nothing. For me, that's a kind of mandate that the first thing we need to do today you know, is insist on a kind of universality of human rights. You know, I've been making my students read Kant as well. You know, go back to Kant, go back to the categorical imperative. You always treat every human being as an end, you know, never as a means. For Kant, you know, anything that can be replaced by something else of its equivalent has a price. Anything that is beyond all price and bears of no equivalent has a dignity. Human beings are distinguished because we do not have a price. We have dignity. And from that comes the categorical imperative. You always treat a human being as an ends, never as a means. If we just kind of went back there and grounded ourselves a little bit, um, maybe there would be some hope. Yeah. Efren, you've been dealing with this in real time, not as a historian, but as somebody who's trying to, to save lives and, and save families. And you've, you've listened to horror stories and, and, uh, of refugees today. And, and do you have hope? I immigrated to the United States when I was 13 years old. And uh, I, I feel that that allowed me in part to, to relate to these families in, in a special, in a particular way. I'm a father, I have two young children and, and that also helped me. But I think if we're committed to the principles of human rights and, and to treating other human beings, regardless of their nationality, their language, we need to continue battling efforts to divide us. Instead of looking for ways to see strangers as different from us, I, I think it's essential to forget about those differences and, and look at the humanity of other people, regardless of whether they speak our same language or what country they were born in or how they came to the United States. If we are going to be true to the principles that we, that we say we are true to, I think it's critical. And I am committed to doing that. That is why I do the work that I do. But it's an uphill battle, and it seems like every generation there comes a challenge to those principles and to those ideals using proxies such as national security and securing the border, or you know they are coming to take our jobs, or any excuse from, from people trying to prevent those who look different th from us from coming into this country. But only by fighting against those uh, efforts to separate us and divide us can we hope to be true to the principles of human rights? Thank you so much, Efren, and thank you for, for being with us today. And thank you, Marcy, for uh, commissioning the film uh, mm -hmm. and the opportunity to explore this history. And thank you, Timothy, as well, for joining us today. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to learn more about the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies, which is based at Yale University, go to fortunoff.library.yale.edu. We also produce, as I've mentioned, a podcast featuring testimony from the archive. You can find the podcast at thosewherethere.org. That's thosewherethere.org or wherever you got your, get your podcasts. This has been a production of CPTV's Cutline in the Community. I'm Eric Marcus, and thank you so much for joining us.